Um, good morning. I'm delighted to be here this morning. And many thanks for the invitation. And also many thanks go to the organizers for this uh, very timely uh, conference. According to liberal political theory and liberal jurisprudence, the main duty of a citizen to a state is the duty to obey the state's laws. However, in the history of Israel, there are two traditions of disobedience of the law, a left-wing tradition and a right-wing tradition. Left-wing disobedience of the law began in the first Lebanon war of 1982. In the course of the war, an organized movement was established whose members refused to take part in the war. Members of the movement claimed that the war was a war of choice as opposed to a war of self-defense and thus an unjust war. In the course of the first Intifada, 1987 to 1993, there were many instances in which soldiers refused to serve in the occupied territories. In the course of the second Intifada, 2000 and 2005, an organized movement was established whose members refused to serve in the occupied territories. Around 1,000 soldiers and officers joined the movement and 2,000 of them were sentenced and incarcerated. Additionally, a group of 27 pilots announced that they would not take part in aerial attacks of Palestinians. In addition to that, since the Six Day War of 1967, there were hundreds of instances in which soldiers, both male and female, refused to serve in the occupied territories, claiming that such service was against their conscience. Since the Six Day War, one may, one may also identify a well-rooted tradition of disobedience of the law in Israel's right wing. This tradition has been much more powerful than the parallel tradition in the left. Israel's right wing disobedience included a large number of deeds. I shall mention only four remarkable instances. First, the Gush Emunim settlement movement, the Block of the Faithful, which was active in Judea and Samaria since the mid 1970s, was described by many authors as a movement that undermined the basis of Israel's democracy. Political theorist Ehud Sprintzak wrote that the Gush developed a practice and ideology of illegalism. The great historian Yaakov Talmon wrote on the Gush that its actions manifested collapse of the rule of law and public order. It is an extra parliamentary movement that wishes to impose its will on the state's institutions by way of employment of sheer might, wrote Talmon. And another renowned historian, Yoshua Arieli, wrote that members of the Gush created their own laws and refused to abide by the law of the state and by the decisions of the state's elected governments. Second, following Israel's peace treaty with Egypt of March 1979, the city of Yamit in the Sinai was supposed to be evacuated. Most residents of the city left it at their own will. But there remained a group that had to be evacuated forcefully by the IDF, Israel Defense Forces, and the police. Thirdly, since the mid-1990s, some 150 unofficial settlements have been established in the West Bank. Talia Sasson was asked by Prime Minister Ariel Sharon to compose a report on these settlements, wrote that in establishing the settlements, an unelected group has acted for determining the boundaries of the state for all its citizens. Sasson defined the establishment of these settlements as nothing short of rebellion of the settlers against the sovereignty of the state. Fourthly, since the late 1990s, we have been witnessing in Judea and Samaria the activities of the Youth of the Hills, Nora Gvot movement. 
members of the movement are involved in acts of violence against Palestinians and their property on a daily basis, as well as in violent acts against soldiers of the IDF, the police, and leftist activists who come to the aid of the Palestinians. Thus far, deeds. I wish to discuss now pronouncements of right-wing spokespersons. In the past five and a half decades, there have been many dozens of instances in which hundreds of rabbis called their disciples to disobey the orders of the government to evacuate settlements and military installations in Judea and Samaria and in Gaza. For brevity of time, I shall mention only a few. In almost all of these instances, disciples of the rabbis followed their directions. A few months after the Six Day War, Rabbi Tzvi Yudha Kohen Cook, the, rabbi, the rabbinic leader of Gush Emunim, issued a halachic judgment determining that transferring any part of Eretz Israel to non-Jews is forbidden by the Torah and any political decision meant to effect such transfer should be, deemed vo should be deemed void and null. If the government orders such transfer, its orders should not be obeyed, concluded Rabbi Cook. In 1995, a group of rabbis headed by Rabbi Abraham Shapira, formerly the chief rabbi of Israel, held that soldiers should disobey their commanders if the soldiers are ordered to evacuate military installations in Judea and Samaria. In 2004, the government adopted the disengagement plan, according to which Israel would evacuate all 20 settlements in the Gaza Strip and four settlements in Northern Samaria. This brought about a long series of pronouncements on the part of hundreds of rabbis including two former chief rabbis to the effect that the government's orders should not be obeyed. And now to my third and last claim, probably the most crucial claim regarding right-wing disobedience of the law in Israel. As I shall show in a minute, left-wing disobedience since the Lebanon War of 1982, as well as the current acts of disobedience directed against the proposed legal revolution initiated by the Netanyahu government are all sanctioned by liberal political theory and liberal jurisprudence. In contrast, right-wing disobedience in the five and a half decades since the Six Day War of 1967 have always been justified by drawing on Jewish halakha namely normative contents that are not part of Israeli law. And now to the acts of disobedience directed in recent months against the legal revolution initiated by the Netanyahu government. On several occasions, it seemed as if the protest against the legal revolution amounted to civil disobedience and conscientious objection. I wish to clarify these concepts, and I wish to argue that civil disobedience may become a major practice of the protesters in the months to come. Even though liberal political theory and liberal jurisprudence view the duty to obey the law as the main duty of a citizen to our state, they do not regard this duty as an absolute one. Liberal political theory and liberal jurisprudence recognize it that in some instances, a citizen may be justified, justified in disobeying the law. The two major doctrines that allow disobedience of the law are the doctrine of civil disobedience and the doctrine of conscientious objection. Academic discussion of civil disobedience in recent decades has been following the discussion of the concept by the great political theorist John Rawls in his 1971 book, A Theory of Justice. Interestingly, Rawls was active in the 1960s and 1970s in the protests against the Vietnam War. Rawls writes that the citizens of a democratic state is not supposed to give up her power of normative judgment. Rawls, together with other political theorists, 
hold that when the state adopts a policy or enacts a law that violates the imperatives of justice or that undermines the basic principles of the constitutional framework of the state's regime, the citizens are entitled to disobey the law. Chaim Gans writes that if participation in democratic elections implies agreement to obey the law, there's no reason to hold that such agreement implies agreement to obey laws that contradict the essentials of democracy or laws that violate basic humanistic values. In the same vein, Yoram Chazoni writes that as governments are composed of human beings, they are prone to moral failures. And therefore, in some instances, citizens have the liberty to disobey the law of their states. Civil disobedience, as mentioned by my friend Eli Salzberger, is a public, political, and usually collective, non-violent act of violation of the law that aims at effecting a change in a government's policy or legislation. Philosopher David Hayde writes that civil disobedience is civil in the sense that it is non-military, as well as in the sense that it is polite, as opposed to violent, or put differently, civil disobedience is peaceful disobedience. In cases in which civil disobedience is instigated by enactment of a law, the disobedience should not necessarily be directed at that law. It may involve violation of some other law. In cases of disobedience, <clears throat> the state is entitled to punish those who violate the law, even when they act peacefully. But usually the power of those who adopt the practice of civil disobedience is in their large number, which makes penal measures against them ineffective. John Rawls, Hannah Arendt, and Joseph Raz write that as civil disobedience amounts to violation of the law, and we should never take violation of the law lightly. So since civil disobedience amounts to violation of the law, it should be adopted only as a measure of last resort, following failure of the regular political democratic processes. As opposed to civil disobedience, which is public, political, and usually collective action, consensual subjection is a private act of a person who seeks to avoid doing something ordered by the law, which the person deems immoral or against a religious beliefs. One can find in the literature three justifications for the liberal state's toleration of consensual subjection. The first justification is respect for the moral judgment of a person. A conscientious objector refuses to obey the law because she deems the act required by her, by her to be immoral or opposed to her religious convictions. The second justification associates conscientious objection with the notion of autonomy. The objector seeks to defend her autonomy as a person having profound moral convictions. And when she is ordered to do something that contradicts these convictions, she cannot be regarded anymore as the author of the story of her life. The third and probably the best justification for our recognition of consensual objection is based on the imperative of avoiding harsh infringement of the personality of persons. People have profound convictions that give their lives identity, meaning, and unity. And when the state orders them to act against these profound convictions, the state undermines people's identity and makes, makes them betray themselves and stop being what they are. There's a wide agreement in the literature that the same act of a citizen may amount to both civil disobedience and conscientious objection. For instance, Joseph Raz writes that the refusal of Americans to participate in the Vietnam War amounted to both civil disobedience and conscientious objection. Edith Zartal writes the same on the refusal of Israeli soldiers 
to take part in the first Lebanon war of 1982. Does the legal revolution initiated by the Netanyahu government threaten to fundamentally change the traits of Israel's liberal democratic regime? I think that unfortunately we have to answer this question in the affirmative. The essence of the government's plan is to bring about control of the legal system by the government. This in addition to the government's substantial control of the Knesset in recent years. Control of the legal system by the government may be the first step in turning Israel into a dictatorship. As early as 1748, the great French thinker Montesquieu argued that the situation in which one group of people controls the executive branch, the legislature, and the judiciary is a clear recipe for tyranny. As is well known, Montesquieu proposed division of political power between three independent branches, each containing the power of the other two. The proposed legal revolution, however, is only one justification for the current protests. Another one, as important as the proposed legal revolution, is the coalition agreements entered into by the Likud party on the one hand, and the five political parties that are Likud's partners in the current government on the other. The ideology of these five parties is premised on three principles. Negation of all normative contents of Western culture, negation of Israel's current liberal democratic regime, and aspiration to replace Israel's current regime by a religious regime. Two of the five parties, the parties of Bengville and Smotrich, have in mind a regime headed by a Messiah King ruling according to the halacha. Three of the parties, the parties of Derry, Goldknop, and Maoz, have in mind a regime headed by a committee of sages ruling according to the halacha. If I had to distill the ideologies of these five parties, therefore, I would say that they, they are aimed at disassociating Israel from Western culture and basing the state's culture, regime, and law on Jewish halacha. I think that it may be argued that the mere signing of the coalition agreements with these five parties and the beginning of the implementation of these agreements are good causes for adopting measures of civil disobedience. These five parties do not bode well, needless to say, to Israeli women, to Israeli LGBTs, and to Israeli Arabs. If they manage in implementing their coalition agreements entered into between these parties and the Likud, then the, uh, it's not, it would not only be the case that Israel's culture would change substantially, the faith of women, LGBTs, and Israeli Arabs uh, would uh, be uh, very different than the way it is today. I noted earlier that Rawls, Arendt, and Raz claim that the civil disobedience may be invoked as a measure of last resort, that is to say, following failure of the regular political democratic processes. The question that arises is whether Israel has reached this stage. On the one hand, it may be argued that since enactment of the legal revolution has not ended yet, the time is not ripe for taking measures of civil disobedience. But senior government spokespersons have made it clear that it is their intention to pursue the legal revolution to its very end. And if one takes into account the contents of the coalition agreements between the Likud party and its five political partners in the current government, and the fact that the government has begun implementing these agreements, then it might be argued that the time is ripe for taking measures of civil disobedience. Moreover, I wish to look at the issue of disobedience from a different perspective. Right-wing spokespersons present the protesters against the legal revolution as hypocrites. 
protesters draw on liberal political theory and liberal law, but they violate the liberal principle of freedom of speech when they do not let politicians identified with the legal revolution to voice their opinions in public, claim right-wing critics of the protesters. Additionally, the protesters violate the liberal principle of freedom of movement when they harass right-wing politicians whenever they identify them in the public sphere. And the protesters violate the liberal principle of freedom of movement when they block roads, sometimes even by lighting fire in them, claim critics of the protesters. So you are hypocrites. You have in your mouth cherished liberal principles and values, but you violate them almost on a daily basis. Thus claim the right-wing uh, critics of the protesters. Are these criticisms advanced by right-wing spokespersons compelling? I suggest that we have to distinguish between two possible eras in the political life of a nation. I shall call the first era the normal times. In this era, there's widespread agreement among the state's citizens as to the basic principles of the regime of their state. And the disputes among the citizens have to do with the ways the state should be run within the bounds of the state's regime, which is widely accepted. So these are internal disagreements and uh, strifes within an agreed upon, a widely agreed upon regime. So this is what I call the normal times. I wish to call the second era the bad times. In this era, powerful politicians act for annulling the liberal democratic regime of the state and for replacing it by an alternative regime, be it a dictatorship or a theocracy. I talk about the bad times. The great Bertolt Brecht wrote about Germany of the 1930s using the term the dark times. So we are, I hope we'll never reach the dark times so that's why I'm talking about the bad times. Definitely we are not at the dark times in the Brechtian sense. And let's all pray that we'll never reach that uh, stage. So the second time I call the bad times. Right-wing spokespersons who present the protesters as hypocrites assume that Israel is still in the era of the regular times. If they are right, then indeed the freedom of speech and freedom of movement of all politicians, including right-wing politicians, should be meticulously preserved, and the freedom of movement of the public at large should be meticulously preserved as well. But what if Israel does not live anymore in what I call the regular times? What if, it, what if in the past eight months, the country has deteriorated to the bad times? Put differently, what if the legal revolution of the Netanyahu government, together with the coalition agreements of that government, have pushed Israel to the era of the bad times, the era in which powerful politicians act for replacing the prevailing liberal democratic regime by an alternative regime? a dictatorship or a theocracy. If indeed Israel is currently in the bad times, then the question arises, how should those who wish to protect the liberal democratic regime of their country act? This question arose in Europe in the interwar period of the 1920s and 1930s, following the rise of fascist and Nazi groups. The question arose again in Europe in recent decades with the rise of extreme right-wing parties. But we should bear in mind that when the question arose in Europe, it was the state institutions that had to take measures against civil society groups that worked for undermining the liberal democratic regimes of their states. Indeed, many European states took measures both in the interwar period and in recent decades for limiting the freedom of association, the freedom of action, 
and the freedom of speech of civil society organizations and political parties meant to undermine liberal democracy. One justification for that was the universal doctrine of self-defense, according to which citizens who support the continuation of the liberal democratic regime of their state are entitled to defend themselves against those who seek to use the extant democratic mechanisms for abolishing liberal democracy. A second justification for taking measures against those aiming at the destruction of liberal democracy draws on the notion of fairness, according to which anybody who takes part in a practice that benefits those in, participating in the practice cannot act within the practice for the abolition of the practice. And here is the crucial point. This is the crucial point. The Israeli situation is the opposite of the European situation. On the one hand, in Israel, opponents of the liberal democratic regime are located in the state's institutions. I have in mind Minister of Justice Yariv Levin and the ministers representing the five parties who are Likud's partners in the current coalition. On the other hand, in Israel, the action in defense of the liberal democratic regime of the state takes place in civil society. That is to say, the actions undertaken in the past seven months by the protesters and not at the state level, as has been the case in Europe. The question that arises, so in Europe, it's the state against civil society. In Israel, it's civil society against the state when the state takes measures that are meant to undermine the liberal democratic regime. The question that arises is what measures may be taken by citizens, citizens, not the state in the Israeli case, who wish to defend the liberal democratic regime of their state against their state institutions that act to undermine liberal democracy. Two classical liberal doctrines immediately suggest themselves, freedom of speech and freedom of demonstration. But in addition to these two doctrines, the doctrine of civil disobedience and the doctrine of consensual objection suggest themselves as well. The protesters of the last seven months availed themselves mainly of the doctrines of freedom of speech and freedom of demonstration. In some instances, the protests spill over to civil disobedience, mainly by way of blogging roads. And Israel is so dynamic that when I wrote that, it's this morning, this is up and not updated anymore because last time there were instances of blocking uh, major uh, highways in the country. But by and large, it, the protesters drew on uh, the, freedom, the rights, the liberal rights of freedom of speech and freedom of demonstration. The, pro, the, mo, the protest movement, the Israeli protest movement, could have resorted to some other measures invoked in similar situations in other countries, such as a tax rebellion. In the past two centuries, there have been hundreds of cases of tax rebellion in various parts of the world. The measure of general strike, the measure of partial strikes, such as, such as lockout of the universities, the theaters, public transportation, etc., and the measure of sit-ins that block access to government employees and the public at large to government offices. Thus far, these measures have not been taken. The protesters drew mainly on the rights of freedom of speech and freedom of a demonstration, no tax rebellion, no sit-ins, etc. What follows it is that when right-wing spokespersons speak about riots in the streets, they bluntly spread lies, at least when we have in mind protesters con the protesters' conduct until the last two weeks. In the last two weeks, the practice of the protesters changed. By and large, the demonstrators Demonstrations have been conducted in remarkable order, and streets and squares are the sites of appropriate for demonstrations. The chief commissioner of Israel's police reported 
to the government some two weeks ago that in the seven months of the protests, not a single policeman was injured by the protesters. And interestingly enough, at that same time, the chief commissioner of the police at the time of the disengagement of the summer of 2005 testified that he had to visit dozens of his men when they were hospitalized following right-wing violence, 2005. However, in some instances, protesters obstructed the ability of politicians to speak in public by making noise that overshadowed the politician's speech. And in other instances, protesters harassed politicians when they identified them in the public sphere. How should we think about protest measures of these types? My answer is that such measures may be viewed as manifestations of the doctrine of civil disobedience. In some instances, it seemed as if soldiers would take measures of consensual objection by way of refusing to report to their military reserve units, or even by way of refusing to report to mandatory military service. Thus far, these measures were not taken. Well, to update this morning, I learned that 160 uh, senior uh, officers of the Air Force sent a letter to the chief of the Air Force that they will not report to their service. So you see how fast and how dynamic, the how fast the situation changes and how dynamic the situation is. So this, as of this morning, there's a beginning of actual refusal to serve uh, in the IDF. However, the question arises, under what circumstances should people act in accordance with their most profound political convictions and the imperatives of their conscience, if not in circumstances in which they are asked by their state to do the most extreme things a person may do in the course of his life, namely to risk his life, to sacrifice his life, and to kill other people? You're asked to do all these extreme things. If they are against your consciousness, how can we expect a person to obey orders to do such things? To, to, to risk a life, to sacrifice a life, and to kill other human beings. And another question that arises, well, whether we find it acceptable that a state be entitled to demand its citizens to, these ex, to do these extreme things when the citizens do not identify with the state's regime on whose behalf they are asked to die and to kill. Yes, such things are plausible in dictatorial regimes in which citizens are regarded as, as instruments at the service of the state's leadership. But in a liberal state, the state is the instrument and the citizen is sovereign. However, in accordance with a universal norm of the law of nature, citizens who object to the regime of their state will nonetheless fight to save their lives if the state is attacked. That is to say, they'll find the state if, if the state is find itself in a war of self-defense. So people will report to their duties if it's a war of state defense, of self-defense. But in cases falling short of self-defense, the government may not coerce its citizens to risk their lives, to sacrifice their lives, and to kill others if the citizens do not accept the essentials of the regime within which the government acts. It seems to me that the implication of this analysis for pilots, for instance, is as follows. I'm told that in order to preserve their flying capabilities, pilots need to train at least once a week. Therefore, pilots need to report to their military units for this kind of training for preparing themselves to situation of self-defense, even in circumstances of regime change. However, if the pilots are demanded to take part in offensive missions, for instance, missions in Syria and in the occupied territories, the pilots should be entitled to refuse to report to their units. In such circumstances, the pilots will have to appear in the conscience committee 
run by the IDF and persuade the committee that the refusal to serve is conscientious refusal. However, so long as they are not exempted from service by the conscience committee of the IDF, they would risk indictment under the military criminal code. Thank you.